when, when we had the, the first uh, lecture. And uh, since then, it's been held every two years. And some of the previous speakers include uh, Heinrich Bedford Strom uh, from Germany, also uh, Wolfgang Huber, uh, Professor Fritz de Lange from the Netherlands, Will Starrer, uh, who's at the Center for Philological Inquiry, gave the lectures, also Professor, uh, the late Professor Wenzel van Heistien, uh, also associated with Princeton Philological Seminary. And then uh, the last time these lectures were held w w um, was in 2018, and then it was delivered by Dr. Alan Busak. And uh, since then, we haven't had these lectures because we had, we had COVID in 2020, so these uh, lectures could not be held, but we are grateful that we can continue that, and we, we look forward to uh, take forward this tradition. Now, many of you might not know the name of Professor David Willem de Villiers. Uh, some of you, you might. I can see some people in the audience who, who, who knew him. And he was a practical theologian, a previous dean, actually served two times as dean here at the faculty. And he was known as Holy David. <laughs> that was his, his nickname, and uh, everybody spoke about him in that, in that way. Also a man of great piety, a uh, very good speaker, and, and so on. But his, his focus as a theologian was in the field of youth work, Christian education, and homiletics. And even after his retirement, he went around to congregations and he collected money uh, that made it possible to establish a center for theological education uh, year at the faculty and uh, that uh, was first called Bifton, later became Communitas and had, had, has a huge uh, impact still. And uh, so we, also, we were really grateful when his sons in ministry decided that they want to donate a fund and that we can also have these lectures. Uh, so a special word of thanks also to Professor Etienne de Villiers, uh, who is also an ethicist, from, formerly from the University of Pretoria. Uh, unfortunately, they, uh, the family cannot be here, but they also ask just to, uh, to send greetings, and uh, they hope to watch also the recording later. So uh, thank you very much for that. Then it's my privilege uh, to also introduce Professor Day. I mentioned that Prof, uh, Prof. de Villiers, after whom the lectures are named, that he was uh, interested and passionately committed to theological education. And Professor Day also wrote a, a book recently, published recently called Notes of a Native Daughter, Testifying in Theological Education. So they, I think there's an important and a, a, a very, a very um, powerful link then between the, the work of the person between your own work and the person uh, after whom these, this lectureship was named. Now, Professor Day is a professor of constructive theology and African-American religion at Princeton Theological Seminary. And uh, she uh, earned uh, uh, also a degree in political science and economic, economics from Tennessee State University and a master's degree in religion and ethics from Yale uh, University. And her PhD was from an, an, another prestigious university, uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville um, in the United States. Now she teach uh, on various topics and her research interests include womanist, feminist theologies, social critical theory, cultural studies, e economics and Afro-Pentecostalism. She has uh, authored several books, I already re referred to one, but the others include Unfinished Business, uh, Black Woman, the Black Church, and the Struggle to Thrive in America. And uh, that was in, published in 2012. And then Religious Resistance to New Liberalism, Womanist and Black Feminist Perspectives uh, in, in 2015. And her most recent book, which we already had the privilege of discussing in a smaller group on Friday, a very rich discussion, uh, is on Azusa Reimagined, A Radical Vision of Religious and Democratic Belonging, published uh, last year in 2022. And she has also been recognized by the uh, NBC News in the United States as one of the six black women at the center of gravity in theological education uh, in America. Quite an quite a accolade that she received in that regard. And uh, furthermore, I can add that she's active in the church. She's a fourth generation preacher in the Church of God in Christ. And uh, Kerry, with that, we are so grateful that you made the long journey. And we look forward to listen to you. I think the lecture will be around 50 minutes. And after that, we will have a bit of time for interaction and discussion before tea.
Welcome. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, good morning. <laughs> Hopefully everybody is, is awakened. I certainly got great sleep last night after three days of trying to adjust myself to this time. Um, but thank you for having me. It's, I just want to say it's been wonderful hospitality um, that's been shown to me among Robert, Julia, and others, uh, a part of the faculty here at Stellenbosch. So thank you again. And I'm very excited about um, having a conversation about the series, Undomesticated Faith and Afro-Pentecostal Theology of Spirit. I do want to note that um, these two lectures sort of reflect the new project that I am working on. Um, but this project in some ways draws upon, and you will see this in the lecture, um, from my book Azusa Reimagined, which I published uh, on last year. And as Robert said, I had the wondrous opportunity of being able to discuss with faculty and postgraduate students, and that was, I think, a rich conversation that I learned uh, a lot from. So. These two lectures I will deliver are based on the Azusa Street Revival of 1906 in Los Angeles, California, in the United States of America, a movement that many scholars sort of hold a consensus over that it sparked and established Pentecostalism in North America, in particular the United States. And these two lectures that I will offer today, there's a particular argument that I want to make I maintain that developing an Afro-Pentecostal theology of spirit involves two primary tasks. And this is, will sort of involve the two lectures I will do today. First, it involves engaging spirit as first word of theology. And then second, speaking of God in a materialist yet apophatic register. So again, I will focus on these two tasks as a way of inching closer to an Afro-Pentecostal theology of spirit that I ultimately maintain cultivates an undomesticated faith. And for this lecture, again, it's fo focusing on the spirit then as first word. So to speak of God at the Azusa revival is first to speak of the spirit. As discussed in my book, Azusa Reimagined, Azusa's heterodox character can be seen through their practices of the spirit. And although I won't be discussing this today, there was a lot of conversation on Friday and in the Q&A, maybe if someone has a question more so about this, and I sort of take it up in my second lecture, we can have this conversation. But sort of a glimpse of the revival was that it was extremely transgressive and counter-cultural to the segregative logics of the day, and even to the gender hierarchy that existed within the United States. With in the South within the United States as well as in other parts of the United States. You had laws on the books uh, that supported racial segregation and gender hierarchy. And at this particular movement, you actually see, for example, women sort of facilitating the conversion experiences of men. You have, for example, black men that are laying hands on white women. When throughout the country, if a black man even looked the wrong way at a white woman, he could be lynched. His life literally could be taken from him. And so these are some of the practices that were going on, not to mention the slave religious practices that were the cornerstone of the religious conversion, conversion experience at Azusa. And so no wonder police, for example, as I talked about on Friday to the group, were being called down to the revival to sort of contain what was going on. As well, my, I'll mention here, and then I'll go back to my conversation on Spirit as First Word, you even had journalists that were coming to Azusa and writing about Azusa. For example, the Los Angeles Times newspaper, one of the most, uh, uh, one could say famous, uh, papers in LA at that time, over 60 to, 60 to seven articles were written about the revival in the first year alone. So you can see the sort of transgressive nature that this particular revival sparked. 
So again, it had a heterodox character. Ministers and others alike sort of made the claim that it's not really Christian because of its countercultural transgressive practices, as well as the slave religious practices that borrowed off of Western African religious forms, sort of mixed with uh, the, 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 the Christian sort of habits and practices, European that is, practices in the US, that it was called heterodox, even her heretical in, char in character. So I want to say that Azusa's religious practices center the importance of spirit as first word of theology, of what we first say about God, ourselves, and the world in framing how we practice Christian faith. In this lecture, I only offer a glimpse of what spirit as first word might look like in theology and how this impacts our theological ideas and speech about God and ourselves. Drawing on studies in new materialisms, black womanist pneumatology, black feminism, and decolonial theory, I argue that we might reroute theology through spirit language so that theology can bear witness to a more expansive, materialist, and liberating view of what God is doing in the world at interpersonal and political levels. In arguing for the spirit, for, for spirit as first word of theology and its ethical import for more emancipatory practices with respect to Christian faith, I first offer a materialist conception of spirit. I next foreground a decolonial turn in spirit language, privileging the question, where is the spirit, instead of what is the spirit. You can see here that, uh, uh, not that I am debunking uh, uh, or trying to outright reject ontological statements about God, but, but part of what I want to argue is that the Azusa Street community, they're much more invested in asking the question first, where is the spirit, and thinking about the spirit and more broadly, who God is and what God does. Finally, I explore one major ethical implication of spirit as first word. Spirit as first word opens us to God's more expansive and revelatory presence beyond, I should say within, against, and beyond dominant doct Christian doctrinal categories that attempt to domesticate or suppress how God is actually active in the material worlds at personal and structural levels. So a note on my decolonial turn, what do I mean by decoloniality? I offer a decolonial interpretation of Azusa, drawing on Argentinian philosopher Walter Mignolo, Algerian poet and philosopher Aimé Césaire, and Latino theologian Oscar Garcia Johnson. Decoloniality refers to the epistemic approaches and political projects opposed to the twin pillars of Western civilization, colonality and modernity. And in some ways, colonality and modernity, these are just not political projects, as I want to argue, but epistemic projects ushered in by the Enlightenment period or the quote unquote age of reason. Decolonial thinkers expose the epistemic and political hegemony of Western categories and how these categories have degraded and dehumanized non-European populations in the quest to civilize and save them. As Aimé Césaire reminds us, Christianity was not just a handmaiden to the European colonizing project, but was the epistemic context that made possible, to use his words, such howling savagery. Christian orthodoxy and its dominant categories concluded that unchristian, non-European peoples were no more than primitive folks engaged in demonic and backward practices. Azusa is born and interpreted through this matrix of coloniality. White ministers again are coming to Azusa and seeing it as savage, primitive, demonic, and barbaric. Its form of religious experience that is Azusa and its expression is filtered through this colonial logic in the descriptions. It is nothing more than demonic danger and savagery dressed up as Christian difference. So then I offer a decolonial reading of Azusa in the sense that Azusa's liturgical life and social practices exercise epistemic disobedience in the face of European colonial logic. 
funded and fueled by Christian orthodoxy and its racial and capitalist logics. The power of a decolonial approach in interpreting Azusa is that it not only tracks how colonial logics operate within the cultural context of Azusa, but also how previously colonized or subjugated people at Azusa resist through epistemic disobedience. A decolonial approach is able to capture how the religious practices of the enslaved in the US were the, were the privileging and implementation of border knowledge or knowledge seen as illegitimate to the dominant center. Azusa members had a different sense of how God is discerned and known in and through their bodies and religious rituals which mediate divine presence rather than simply relying on philosophical and theological beliefs. And here, when I speak of belief, I'm speaking of propositions that we sort of give cognitive assent to, right? Now certainly, as I will continue to talk, that in, with the Zuza, there is a kind of rethinking of belief, and I'll talk about that in the second lecture, where it's just not about abstract ideas that the mind gives cognitive assent to, but it's about sort of embodied practice and the ways, the ways those embodied practices then sort of impact and shape how we think about the world and about God that is, uh, that is belief, to determine the content of who God is and what God does. For my work, a decolonial approach does not simply attend to the question of how to include previously subjugated communities into the dominant Christian categories, but attempts to expose how the European colonial Christian gaze shapes the discursive and material fields out of which Christian claims and meanings are literally being thought and performed in the first place, right? Claims about Christian identity, ideas of Christian faithfulness, ideas of the human and more. A decolonial reading of Azusa challenges, challenges Christian theology in this way and ask what theological approaches might be fruitful in demonstrating how this community resists theologically and what that teaches us about God and the world around us. And so part again of what I'm wanting to say is the spirit is the cornerstone as a way for the, the Azusa community at least to think its way into God and the world and themselves within the world. So with that being said, I want to offer a materialist conception of the spirit. Among feminist critical race political and queer theories, Studies on new materialisms have been centralized, attending to the agency of matter itself. Although one ya aboriginal writer, Alexis Wright, reminds us that one might ask what is new about new materialisms as indigenous perspectives, that is indigenous materialisms, have long explored the active subject status of all creation. Far from being inert and therefore passive, matter acts, creates, destroys, transforms, and thus is more of a process than a thing. U.S. religious and theological thinkers such as George Tinker, Clara Sue Kidwell, Jorg Riger, and Catherine Keller reject traditional ontological hierarchies, especially those that seek clear distinctions between spirit and matter, life and non-life, sentience and non-sentience. They reject these dualisms. For example, within both, both indigenous and new materialist studies, human matter is not seen as something ontologically discrete from the materiality of the world. Yet this statement doesn't suggest a kind of ontological equality between human matter and the materiality uh, of, of the world, because in some ways it suggests that these are separate things that interact. For indigenous thinkers and new materialists, human flesh and the flesh of the world are not simply ontologically equal because they are not things in the first place. Instead, they are already and always multiplicities, assemblages, hybrids, interact, interactions, and complexities. American feminist scholar Donna Haraway reminds us, and I quote her here, quote, that human genomes can only be found in about 
of all the cells that occupy the space I call my body. The other 90% of the cells, our cells, are filled with the genomes of bacteria, fungi, protists, and such. I become an adult human being in the company with these tiny messmates. To be one is to always to become with many, end quote. One might refer to this ontology as folded rather than flat, in the words of Catherine Keller, as each multiplicity is symbiotic, all is becoming and coming undone in relation to constitutive multiplicities. I would like to foreground a materialist conception of the spirit that folds into human flesh and the flesh of the world. I think it would be a mistake to use the language of folded ontology with respect to the spirit. As spirit is that which moves in and through, yet transcends the materiality of the world in making itself known. Yet, spirit, in making itself known, folds into the materiality of humans and the more than human world in communicating something about who God is and what God does. So notice I'm not saying a folded ontology, but in many ways the spirit folds in two, right? It's a, a small but important nuance I'm making there. Spirit is present and active through the materiality of the world. Such a materialist conception of the spirit resists ontological hierarchies that subordinate matter or flesh to the spirit. Instead, the spirit and flesh, flesh and spirit, enfold into each other in revealing divine life and how God is with and for creation. As theologian Mark Lewis Taylor notes, quote, liberating spirit is not the opposite of matter. It is not outside earth in its relations. It does not abstract itself from the social and political, the natural and the planetary. Instead, liberating spirit is the organizing energy within these relations and working among them, end quote. So for me as a scholar situated in doing work within black Christian traditions in the US, I do believe that my materialist view of the spirit marks the Christian story. A major idea that is threaded through the Christian story is the idea that the spirit reveals a God in and through the material processes of creation. The spirit of God moves upon flesh, inhabits flesh, and reveals the character and activity of God in and through such fleshly material processes. In creation, the spirit of God hovers over the waters, creates the material processes of the world, and yet establishes a relationship of interdependence with, this crea with these creative processes, processes, disclosing a God who is shaped and affected through the world in all of its material differences and otherness. A note I will return to because I do know that in some ways this does challenge some doctrines, say the doctrine of aseity and other kinds of doctrines on, on God. In the incarnation, the spirit reveals a God who rests, lingers, and delights in the flesh, a scandalous claim of the incarnation in my estimation. In the ministry of Jesus, the spirit moves through the flesh of Jesus, guiding and directing him into all truth to fulfill what he was sent to do. Yet, the spirit moves within the flesh of the world as Jesus reveals God's presence in new, unique ways. Think, walking on the water, turning water into wine, multiplying fish and bread. Even at Pentecost, the spirit moves through the flesh of the disciples in the upper room, unleashing tongues as fire in the wave of baptism. The spirit points to how God's divine presence is always made manifest through the material life of the world. I want to slow down and say a bit more about how the spirit moves through flesh and why the flesh of the world is central to the revelation of God. I take my cue from decolonial theologian Myra Rivera and womanist constructive theologian Karen Baker Fletcher. For Rivera, flesh matters. 
flesh matters to understanding the nature and character of God and how we might think about human becoming in the world in relation to God and others. For Rivera, flesh is not simply static substance. I quote her here, quote, it is a relation, an endless becoming, end quote. Rivera turns to the Gospel of John to elucidate this important theological statement that we find at the beginning of John. The word became flesh. Logos does not become man as such, but flesh. This is an important distinction, as God becoming flesh is about a relation and entering into the world to touch the flesh of humanity and broader creation to be affected and changed. Moreover, John links the flesh to the elements, bread, water, light, wind, and spirit. Through Rivera's Johannine reading of the flesh, she maintains that flesh is not a self-contained mass, but it folds into the elements to be shared, which then is received and becomes part of many bodies, part of the flesh of the world. Flesh interlaces with other material elements, always given and received and always being transformed and transforming. Another way of saying it, our flesh enables the transformation of ourselves and the broader world. I also take my cue from womanist theologian Karen Baker Fletcher, who offers an account of divine life by exploring the interrelationship between material life, that is flesh, and spirit. For Baker Fletcher, dust and spirit are folded into each other. As spirit innervates dust, so dust innervates and reveals spirit. Baker Fletcher foregrounds a robust theology of creation that takes seriously the embodiment of God, Jesus, and the spirit in the world. One can only speak of the spirit by turning to the spirit's operations within creation and incarnation. How the spirit moves and conceives within the materiality and flesh of the world, revealing a God who intensely desires intimacy with God's creation. I find compelling Baker Fletcher's conclusion that discerning and perceiving the spirit happens in our created world and demonstrates the inextricable connection between God, God's revelation, who God reveals God's self to be, and the material world that shapes and forms, and forms us. God's revelation is only perceptible through the spirit's engagement with the flesh of the world. Consequently, the flesh of the world cannot be subordinated to our conversation of God and spirit. It remains central to know, knowing something about God and spirit. I agree with Rivera and Baker Flesh Fletcher that flesh is a site of relation and exchange between God and creation, right? This is their argument here. That flesh is a site of relation and exchange between God and creation. As the incarnation reveals God's radical love for creation, so our flesh creates openings and possibilities for communion and love with God and others in the world. Flesh weaves connections between God, humans, and all creation. It is our flesh, our bodies, that keep us open then to others. Flesh is central to the revelation of God because God reveals in the flesh of the world God's desire to love radically and to be touched by the world in all of its difference in otherness. I want to note, so you're asking why does this matter? This I'm pressing the flesh as a relation, right? As an opening to God and others, why? I want to note that much of Christian theology in the West has understood the flesh in either sinful ways or simply as a, or, or simply as a vehicle through which the higher element of our spirit operates in the world. Moreover, if flesh is seen as something more than that which the human spirit inhabits, it is often with reference to the mystery of Christ's body as something 
as, as being categorically different from other bodies. In this account, one is not able to see the mystery, unsayability, and opacity of all flesh. The flesh has mystery and depth because of its relation to God and creation. Much of Christian theology maintains that what makes human life humans like God is not our flesh. In fact, our flesh is what holds us captive to the carnal realities of this world. This Pauline theology, and I say Pauline theology because Pauline scholars disagree that, that Paul himself makes the argument uh, that the materiality of the world or the flesh of the world is something that is simply subordinate um, to spiritual matters. And so Pauline theology, meaning interpretations of, of, of Paul, this Pauline theology of the carnal, uh, of the carnal flesh is suffused within Christian discourse. Flesh is no longer about the possibility of relational becoming and more about a sinful body as a site of purification and the exercise of power. Now, for certain, flesh can be treated as a relation of ruin, a site of exploitation and death. In my working manuscript, I spend some time talking about flesh as a relation of ruin. As systems like white supremacy in the US have treated black flesh as object and commodity, perverting and exploiting the inherent value and worth of black flesh. And for this, I draw a lot upon black feminisms in the US that are considerably developing this idea um, of the flesh as a kind of relation uh, of ruin. Consider, consider the story of Joyce Heth, as recounted by black feminist historian Dana Ramey Berry. Employed by P.T. Barnum and his circus, I don't know how many are familiar with the P.T., the Barnum Circus, that started nationally, but it became sort of internationally renowned, this circus. Heth was advertised in this circus as purportedly a 161-year-old enslaved woman and the former nurse of George Washington, the first president of the United States. Barnum made $1,500 a week, displaying her at halls and facilities throughout parts of the nation, like a human zoo of sorts with this woman. She sang hymns and told stories as part of Barnum's freak show. In seven months, Barnum made roughly $42,000 from her which today is equivalent to $1.1 million. I don't know in Rand how much that is, but one that's a lot, $1.1 million. Heth made nothing. She died in 1836, and in order to uncover the cause of her death, Barnum, alongside physicians and surgeons, scheduled a public autopsy. And a note on public autopsies at this time in the 1800s in the US, public dissections and autopsies in medical uh, and university settings were common in the 19th century, as these public spectacles were a way to extend the profits of slavery beyond the grave, making money from the slave even in death, what Barry refers to as a ghost value. Medical political and economic leaders paid to attend Heth's public autopsy. People also paid for newspapers that described the event, discussing Heth for months or years after she died. Medical and university institutions profited from slaves post-mortem such as Heth from their dead bodies. Her autopsy would be in service to advancing medical science for decades. So then, in front of an audience of 1,500 on that day that they did an autopsy of Heth's body, of which people paid for, people awaited for the attraction to begin. Physicians and surgeons expected to see extreme ossification of the arteries near her heart if she was as old as Barnum alleged, being 161 years old. However, when they opened her, Heth had the internal organs of a woman in her 70s. Yet Barnum 
was able to collect fees for her very public display after she died. Barnum and the medical establishment were able to commodify Heth's flesh even in death. The once enslaved body had a different purpose upon death for these medical leaders. The black body was manufactured into a valuable commodity that could be used to train medical doctors in the halls of some of America's most prestigious schools like Harvard, Dartmouth, the University of Virginia, and the University of Chicago. A ghost value for the dead enslaved was a necessary part of this commodification process. The fiscal value of the slave post-mortem or the cadaver became tradable goods. Certainly, this example that I'm offering sort of gives you a sense of how flesh can be a relation of ruin, fostering gross domination, violence, and even trauma, what I would refer to as social sin. So then I want to challenge this way of understanding and treating the flesh as a site of ruin, right? Part of what I want to argue here is that flesh is a site of regeneration, right? It's a site of becoming because it is the opening in some ways to our encounter with the divine, with God, and with others. Theologically, the flesh can be a site of relational becoming and is the site through which the spirit mediates divine presence, opening us up to communion with God and others, and this last statement is important, and also, and also the flesh in opening us up to God and others, offering then a subversive critique of the degradation, exploitation, and expro expropriation of flesh, such as the interpersonal and political dimensions of existence. This theological reading that I'm offering of flesh can challenge, I believe, and address the trauma and violence associated with treating flesh as a relation of ruin and violence. And so in my lecture thus far, I have advanced a materialist account of the spirit, a flesh-centered account of the spirit as, in the words of German theologian Michael Welker, where is the spirit of God? And this is, I'm sorry, quote, this is Michael Welker, quote, where is the spirit of God? And where can we discern the spirit in life, end quote. The where question is not simply a question of place or space, but more deeply a question of theological epistemology with respect to divine life. Epistemology here meaning the study of knowledge, how we come to know what we know about something. And so here I think this where question, again, is not just about place or space, but it, in some ways it's, it's a question about how we come to know something about divine revelation, right? That is how God reveals God's self and God's saving act, actions in and through the material world. For me, the question, where is the spirit of God, involves foregrounding how I read in a bit more detail the story of divine grace. I do not interpret the story of grace simply from the incarnation to the cross, but from creation to Pentecost. This has profound implications for the where question. So then from creation to Pentecost, as seen in the Hebrew body, uh, a Bible in the Old Testament, God is revealed in and through the flesh of the world. God's saving acts are bound up with creation. God is not only revealed in the life of Israel, but also made known through the spirit in the materiality of the world, through animals, buildings, such as temples, tents, fire, water, rocks, tornadoes, rain, food, and so much more. God's character and saving acts are inextricably linked to God's creation. And through the Spirit, God especially reveals God's self in humans and material landscapes that are deemed disposable, disposable and marginal. As witnessed in the Gospels and in Acts, we similarly meet a God who is revealed through the material cultures and worlds of those who are treated as disposable, those who are seen in material terms as the waste of the world. In the incarnation, 
We witness God, God's uh, revealed presence in Bethlehem, a poor town ridden by poverty, where many people lived in modified caves, a town without any beauty or honor. It's not just that Jesus was a poor Jew, but that Jesus was born in material squalor that reinforced the cultural representations of Jews and their material surroundings as disposable, rejected, despised, and undesirable. Jesus also grows up in Nazareth, a town equally without honor among the dominant. Yet God announces God's home in this presumed squalor, where people deem nothing good coming from. Recall in John 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 46, Nathaniel asks, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Anything, a term which gestures toward the undesirability of the impoverished material landscape, as well as the people who reside on these landscapes, really at least in the popular imagination, right, that this is a disposable people and land, pointing to the thingification of both land and people, that term thingification of people I've read Aimé Césaire, this is what Aimé Césaire talks about, the way in which uh, non-European people are then seen as a thing, as object, as commodity, as a way to empty themselves, as a way that is colonial, the colonial project, to empty these pre people precisely of their humanity and to justify and legitimate projects of colon colonialism. In Jesus' ministry, we witness a God who reveals God's self precisely through this material squalor, land and people, even engaging the elements of the world, that is bread as I talked about, water and so forth, to reinforce the beauty, worth, and dignity of the oppressed and despised masses. Think here again, meager fish loaves multiplied to feed the starved masses or turning water into wine for those who ordinarily couldn't afford it, demonstrating that the materiality of the world is central to God's revelation of being with and for the vulnerable and creation more broadly. On the cross, God makes God's salvific presence known through a lynched body. A discourse James Cone in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, a discourse Cone clarifies for us in which the Jewish body as object and commodity under Roman imperialism is imbued with divine redemptive, redemptive significance. It is this body, this flesh, that reveals a God who is nearest to those on the underside of life, that is Jesus' body. But let us not forget that Jesus is executed on a cross, a material element that signified within Jewish tradition a divine curse now redeemed to communicate divine solidarity. Body and tree are bound together, liberated together. Humanity and broader creation, revealing that God offers divine transformation and redemption at the site of disposable groups and material landscapes that are degraded under states of domination. And at Pentecost and the Acts Church, I, I personally see a notion and practice of religious conversion that is not simply about right belief, as I said uh, not too long ago, belief merely as sort of this cognitive assent to a set of propositions about God, generating repentance and transformation, Instead, conversion is made possible, that is, at Pentecost and the Acts Church, conversion is made possible through bodies and material resources being arranged in private and public spaces. Bodies arranged in a way that gesture toward a new countercultural community and humanity, configured in relations of love, justice, and care. In my account, Conversion, and really when I say my, as I, as I read um, uh, uh, Acts and what is going on in the early church, conversion is not merely psychological or intellectual in that sense of the usage of the mind, but it is material. Conversion reflects a material practice as well of communities arranging bodies in ways that demonstrates the just reign of God practices of care, justice, and belonging being realized. P 
Pentecost then, this arranging of bodies and material resources to demonstrate relational patterns of justice, love, and belonging in private and public spaces is not merely the effect of redemption, but I want to argue is the content and tell us of redemption. The point I am making is that the Spirit reveals a God at the sight of the flesh of the world and reveals how God's activity in and through material worlds links with God's love for humanity and broader creation. Divine revelation is always a question of where the Spirit of God is. The precarious material conditions and populations who are deemed disposable within these conditions that the gospel emerges from cannot be divorced from who God is in Jesus Christ and what this means for salvation. So let me turn to the Azusa Street Revival of 1906 in Los Angeles. At Azusa, we see the spirit forging a new human identity and community, that community at Azusa, not grounded in the segregated colonial logics of American racist empire, right? You see this community sort of going against the grain and challenging through their embodied sense of community. For this early Pentecostal community, the spirit not only mediates divine presence, that is God's presence, through the black body, through black flesh, but also joins unlikely hostile bodies together, that is white, black, other M Armenian, African, I mean, just span the ethnic spectrum at this community, but joins these bodies together in a way, I would argue, that queers the body of Christ. Of Christ, and when I say queer here, I'm thinking in uh, the way that uh, systematic constructive theologian Lynn Tonsted, in her book Introduction of Queer Theology, understands queer uh, not only as uh, saying something about sexuality as such, but also as that which deviates from the norm, right? That which is seen as countercultural to the dominant center. Much of, uh, much of American Christianity has operated within white binary thinking, an us versus them logic, which produced racist, sexist, and classist ideas, practices, and institutions. The human within human community has been trapped within the existence of whiteness, to use uh, theologian Willie uh, Jennings' words. This inevitably has shaped American Christianity in which such insider-outsider logic is deeply racialized and gendered. Azusa then, and its way of embodying Christian faith, deviates from the normative center of this entire colonial way of thinking. And this is what I'll really be substantially exploring in the next lecture. Instead, members across warring identities, that is across racial identities, uh, uh, as well as gender identities, but at Azusa, against these warring identities, they wrestled with how to see each other as kin, as family, as expressive of a new community that could not exist and could even be punished for existing. Again, thinking police are coming down to Azusa wanting potentially to make arrests because of the outlandish race mix, mixing that is going on. This new humanity, I would argue, or identity at Azusa, is queer in the sense that it refuses the normative center of binary thinking over identity and rejects the insider-outsider logic of colonial practices. The spirit at Azusa attempts to forge a new way of being together, which is an affront to the fragmented, divisive racial logic and material that is capitalist practices of the day. This is the power of the spirit at Azusa. It reveals a God that seeks to reveal a new humanity at the sight of those most disenfranchised and marginalized, but those disenfranchised coming into contact with other kinds of communities, hence my conversation about flesh being a relation of becoming, right, and opening to others where all of this is going on. So again, at Azusa, we see, sort of connecting to my materialist conception of the spirit, that the question of where is the spirit is a vital question, right, um, in, in Christian theology, that is, and thinking through 
who, what the spirit is, who the spirit is, and, 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 and with respect to God. And part of my argument, again here, uh, is that where, the where question is very important for Christian theology and that Azusa serves as a resource in thinking then about the spirit. At Azusa, the spirit mediates divine presence through bodies, but also mediates divine presence through the broader material culture of this community. In Azusa, we imagine I talk about the, the built environment of the Azusa community. So I've talked a lot about the materiality, meaning from the natural world, right, and even from our bodies. But also, I think it's important to mention that there are some scholars talking about the built environment as an extension of the ways in which the spirit, right, and religious experience is mediated through this other kind of materiality. William Seymour, the pastor of the Azusa community, secured a dilapidated building that they could convert into a church. In fact, this was this sort of this building was once a barn converted into a church. Really, I'm sorry, it was, it was a Methodist church, then it became a barn, and then it was converted into a church. And so he does this, and he employed, and I should say the community employed, primarily handmade musical instruments from the waste of capitalism. And as a side note, I mean, William Seymour has all these sermons. He's critiquing the, uh, not just the white religious communities, but the educated black uh, churches, because in their moneyed hymnals and pipe organs and all these different things, they think that they have access to God. They think they are more favored by God because of the, you know, this kind of material culture that is communicating something about God. And so in some ways, uh, it's sort of an inverted here, right? That Azusa, and these are very poor people too, that Azusa is, is using handmade musical instruments, what is considered by broader society as the waste of capitalism. And as I will discuss more extensively in the next lecture, this barn turned church had cobweb lined ceilings, a dirt floor, and handmade pews that felt like the church was more on a frontier than in a progressive city like LA. The musical instruments that were essential to their worship, that is the Azusa worship experience, of the divine were instruments either hand created from household items such as washboards or instruments that were donated after heavy use. The point here is that the sonic and aesthetic would be central to this movement, movement of the spirit and would be facilitated through, excuse me, through a material environment that was seen as the waste of capitalism, the squalor of society. What might this reveal about the spirit and therefore God's presence? <clears throat> Perhaps the spirit reveals divine presence through the waste of the world. In the words of feminist philosopher of religion, Karen Bray, and I quote her here, <clears throat> quote, how might a return to the potency of that which we think as disposable help us rethink a religio-ethical call to be ever more in communion with all kinds, with all of creation? What kind of God might live in what we deem as the waste of the world? What kind of religious practices, prayers, laments, liturgies, study, worship might honor such a God? We will need to experience discomforts and contingencies inherent in those who have been considered disposable and worthy of expulsion from the social and religious body." End quote. Again, in my next lecture, I return to this material question of why it matters that God is revealed in the waste of the world, so to speak, and what that means for how we talk about God's, uh, who God is and how God is acting in the world. And so in conclusion, given the diverse and multiple ways that God reveals God's self and is actually at work in the material world, part of what I'm arguing here is God is at work in such diverse ways, right, that categories that seek to speak in absolute terms uh, about God without a sense of limit or mystery uh, in, in many ways ends up domesticating God as such. That because uh, God speaks in these diverse ways, reveals God's self in these di diverse ways within the material world, we might reroute theology through spirit language so that theology can bear witness to a more expansive, materialist, and liberating view of who God is and what God is doing. I am convinced that this way of talking about the spirit as queer 
It is a deviant interpretation, moving away from the normative center, and I want to add here, and establish ways, Lynn Thompson might say straight ways, of speaking about God and spirit, uh, speaking about God and spirit, for example, strictly appealing to ontological statements about God as the only or privileged departure point in talking about the spirit. You have a number of, of theologians that in talking about the spirit for the most part uh, within the systematics would begin with the Trinity. And I want to be very clear that my lectures and my manuscript is not non-Trinitarian. It's, it's, it's absolutely um, uh, embraces an understanding of the Trinity. But I think the point here that is uh, that I'm trying to make is that Azusa offers a way for us to think method Methodologically, at least, another entry point into how we might understand the spirit that open, and therefore God, that opens up to mystery, as I'll talk about in the next le lecture, opacity, wonder, uh, and so forth, and, and more specifically, ways that cannot be captured precisely in the ontological statements we're making about God or that flow from those ontological statements that we often might see at when scholars begin simply with Trinitarian language. I also think that my account of the Spirit has been the story of divine grace, talked about in scripture, various traditions, pockets of Christian experience, and the larger world that we neither fully know nor can't control. As we cannot fully comprehend or control God, so our concepts cannot. But we can reroute our theological concepts and understanding through the sacred grammar of Spirit in order to honor a certain unsayability mystery, opacity, wonder, and apophaticism that characterizes the spirit and therefore God. So in my le next lecture, I turn to this divine unsayability and what this opacity and mystery, that is divine opacity and mystery means for God talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Day, also for that uh, rich lecture and uh, also for, uh, you know, what you have said and how it invites us also to join you in con uh, con further conversation. And uh, we also look f uh, forward to uh, how you will unpack it in the next lecture. So let's open it now to a ra round of questions and comments. We have about 10 minutes or so before before tea times and, and some re uh, refreshments. So can I just uh, get an indication? Anybody? that want to lead it uh, with a question or a comment? I see, t I see two hands, uh, Keegan there at the back, and over there, and then uh, Lambert. I, I suggest we take those three questions, um, and then uh, I'll, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a pen. This is the second time I've done this. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Uh, so let, let's start here at the back, and then move forward. Yes, Keegan. Uh, thanks, Professor Day. Um, I'm just wondering, if you use, in, your, in your reading of Acts, you use the language of conversion. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if this language might be, in terms of exegetically appropriate, if you think of first century understandings of, of, of how, you know, a, a first century concept of religion as such, and you, mm -hmm. you're using, we use language of religion, mm -hmm. of religions. Mm -hmm. So often what we talk about when we, when we, when we refer to conversion, we're yeah. talking about this movement from one religious body to another. But in terms of ancient understanding, we know that this is not quite an accurate, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of an anachronistic way of talking yeah. about first century movements between you. So yeah. I'm just wondering in terms of your own language, whether you, mm. where you use it, whether maybe you could problematize some of that uh, language of conversion. And then also I think this language of conversion, some, if you think of someone like Paul, for Paul, as far as I understand it, you know, my, my fiance is a New Testament scholar as well, but, you know, the language of, of conversion is not so much about this changing off from one religion to another, which is some of the way we modern it, right. but uh, in some ways a, a, re, a, a reorientation towards God. And so, and you just, in your, your lectures about uh, embodiment, space, materiality, spatiality, uh, I wonder if this also could be con this language of what we term conversion could also be thought out in these kind of um, spatial, material, we're all in terms of which, and in some ways, 
putting aside some of these, um, you can say strongly, you know, you say uh, you know, post-Protestant and um, Protestant, you know, concepts of religion, mm -hmm. and yeah. also hard, a lot of strong Christian hegemonic readings of, of what um, you know what conversion implies. So I'm just yeah. wondering whether you would be, you know, just talk a bit about that. Um, That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Keegan. Um, um, I just, uh, it's not, it's not about Sona, but uh, I was thinking about the, the explanation about the, the, uh, where it's going to be. Uh, does it also, because it, 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 I, what I hear is the, some sort of limited place to Christianity, but to me, I also feel like it, that, that where it can also break the religious barriers. Um, hmm. So not only Christianity, but also um, because yes. if, if you start with theology in, in, um, in, in the spirit, um, it, it does uh, kind of, you know, um, not only limits itself to Christianity, but also other religion. And maybe you can just repeat that. Yep. Uh, thanks for that as well. And then Robert. Thank you. Uh, this is Dave. I wanted to make a remark on your, your remarks regarding the crucifixion. Mm. And uh, when you said uh, of the body and tree, I thought of the spiritual, where you're there when they crucified my ah, God, yes. when, you, mm. when you're there when they nailed him to a tree, mm. or across mm. a tree. And, um, and then uh, there are actually schools of thought that uh, think that the cross wasn't a pole with a crossbar, but actually a, a living tree. Mm where the cross ball was sort of added, uh, sort of just a cross branch or something. Um, and, the, and that would actually strengthen your argument in the sense of body and tree uh, being, being united. But, but uh, this is sort of a, huh. this a remark. Great, and I thought I saw one more, one more swift, Tim, and okay. I can answer um, all four, yeah, if that's fine? Let's, let's okay. hear, uh, that's a good, a good and suggestion. And I can answer all at once. <laughs> let's, let's see if there's, uh, uh, I think, Marnes. Any other questions? Okay, um, Marnes, right. we'll take your question, four and then uh, uh, in one final yep. round, uh, Kerry, if you can then just respond to all the questions. Should, should I? You can go now. now. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, something really helpful, I think, for the first one, especially thinking spirit and body together. <laughs> Um, sort, of this, sort of this materialist account um, of, of spirit and so on. So, so I was wondering about the category of movement. I really like mm. sort of what you were doing at the end. Um, and, and I was thinking sort of often when we speak and we sort of use the language of the spirit is on move or you know, the spirit is moving. I mean, and that's the one thing bodies also do. We, we right. move. So I was wondering sort of if you can maybe comment a bit mm. on that, especially sort of Jason, sort of what you said at the end. Um, you're almost in a sort of dramatic, um, uh, you know, sort of how everything plays out, sort of as a drama in a dramatic yeah. sense, I guess. Yeah, this is so helpful. Yeah, and, um, if I can just use the chair, but I, I oh, also no. just have one question. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. If you don't mind. No, no. And um, at one stage, you, you, you spoke about creation and the from creation to Pentecost, mm -hmm. and um, you spoke about Pentecost, but as you were speaking, I was also thinking of Babel and the story mm -hmm. of the Tower of Babel, and because that text and a certain use of creation theology mm -hmm. was so part of the uh, apartheid theology and the justification mm -hmm. of separateness, oh, um, mm -hmm. and you know, diversity and use as the alibi even for separation, and so on, you know, how you, your yeah. views of recollecting creation theology uh, and, and, you know, how you see the, the story of the Tower of Babel within that mix. I know that's also a big question, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. but I just throw that into, uh, just to give you um, something to talk about. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no. Thank you. So I do apologize if I uh, am not able to treat in detail all of these questions, but these are so good, five. So the first one, first thank you. I think that this is a really valid critique. I'm thinking here, for example, of, um, I don't know why his first name is escaping me, but last name Nongbri, who wrote a, uh, thank you, okay, yes, yes, who offers really a very important and timely um, uh, sort of a critique of uh, the modern uses, and of course, this is uh, his background uh, is actually in languages. Right? He's a, 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 a biblical studies scholar, it's in languages. And so, part of the argument there is that 
in many ways, modern scholars attempt uh, to describe what is happening in ancient communities as religion as such is uh, uh, not only anachronistic, but in some ways may do a kind of hermeneutical violence, right, to actually what is going on. So just the question itself reminds me of being clear about my own words and categories. But I think why that's really uh, important to how I'm thinking um, about Azusa, so I'll just say this in addition for people that don't know Nangbri, um, is uh, for Nangbri then, uh, he wants to think about ancient uh, um, uh, uh, forms, uh, 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 not in sort of the modern register that we think today of religion as these system of beliefs and practices that are set apart from the secular, but rather um, what they're doing, the sacred, is a kind of orientation, right? But that it's suffused throughout all, throughout all of existence, right? Um, uh, and so that any transformation that is happening is within this more holistic view, that any re re reorientation that is happening is, when, is within this more holistic view, right, of, 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 of custom or way of life that characterize the quote unquote sacred in ancient times. That's really important, so I'm just affirming right now, that's really important to uh, what I'm trying to do in Azusa because I am in this particular manuscript, I am attempting to rework um, the category of belief, right? That what is making Azusa so epistemically transgressive is that through its embodied liturgical practices, it's actually challenging and rejecting belief as sort of this cognitive performance, right? Propositions, abstract things that people just merely, a form of rationality, right, that we produce that is, that is sort of understood with the mind. Uh, and, and, that, uh, and that in some ways, belief in and of itself might be this something that is located between sort of even, when I say category, meaning the kind of ideas that we do have, between category and practice. It's both of these. But, but, but it's, it's shaped in a particular kind of way, belief itself. Um, that registers at the level of body. So here's how this plays out practically, and then I'll go into the next question. Um, what does it mean uh, within the United States when Azusa in 1906, when all this is going on, when, and this is what William Seymour talks about in one of his sermons, what does it mean to be a Christian? Actually, it's in their doctrinal handbook as well. Or, I'm sorry, their, 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 their book of uh, Christian uh, discipleship. I meant to say that, Christian discipleship. Is what does it mean to be a Christian? Uh, it means to be a Christian when you just, uh, how it states, I'm paraphrasing here, not only when you've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your heart, but if you've removed all prejudice from your life, right? And so this is, this is in some ways communicating something very different about belief because, and this is a very important statement in the book of Christian discipleship, because from slavery onward in the US, even the transatlantic slave trade throughout the Americas and larger world, um, you have uh, 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 Christian uh, plantation owners, uh, as well as those involved in the slave trade, who would be able to worship Jesus on Sunday uh, and then talk to their slaves about Jesus, but then beat their slaves on Monday, right? So I'm worshiping this God and saying that I'm Christian on Sunday, but then I'm able to hold uh, these people as a kind of property and commodity. There's a, there's a gap here, right, that Seymour is saying, there's something, there's something wrong about the nature of belief in and of itself. So thank you. I just wanted to, <laughs> yes, it's very, very important. Second, where is uh, the spirit, you're absolutely up to something. You're anticipating my second lecture, um, quite literally. Um, because you're right, it doesn't limit it uh, then uh, to Christianity as such, but it begins to break religious barriers. Um, and, and so what I'll say there is let's bracket that, um, because in the second lecture, I'm offering uh, an Afro-Pentecostal meditation on God. And a part of that is trying, what the spirit does, is thinking about that kind of mystery and unsayability that allows us then to ask questions that, 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 that may not be within our kind of dominant orthodox positions, right? Um, third, the crucifixion, I have a source on this. <laughs> I, I mean, this is really, really intriguing to me. And that uh, I hear you write that there's actually a bar, you were saying, that... Yeah, um, or, or just even this little, what you would call it, the status of two by four, just yeah, plan. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. So even the connection of flesh to the tree. I mean, 
uh, source. <laughs> so I look forward to coming up to you. Um, um, uh, fourth, um, movement, uh, movement. Right, <laughs> okay, I want to make sure. Um, you know, so it, it seems, this is the hunch that I have, because this is such a new project. I just started this project uh, about a year ago, um, or a little under a year ago, just writing and thinking and, and on a, a new reading program. So, I mean, movement is at the center of, and, and, and it, it is movement of the body, movement of the flesh of the world, um, and, and of the spirit, but um, movement as a kind of, maybe I could say epistemological category, right? It's a way of thinking about not only, I think, the production of knowledge, in this case, as I'll talk about in the second le lecture, through the religious rituals of, of Azusa, the way in which the spirit, uh, the body is moving uh, in, in, in sort of uh, uh, in line or, or in connection with the spirit produces something surprising uh, uh, and, 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 and uncontainable and unorthodox in, in that sense. But, but in producing the surprising and, un and, and, and undomesticated and uncontainable, it then challenges the very sort of foundations by which, and in this way, it, epistemic foundations, the categories that we rely on to explicate, say, God or Jesus or who we are as a body of Christ, uh, maybe as held distinct from the world, uh, a, a very strong demarc demarcating line, or even the materiality of the world. And so I think right now my hunch is that where I want to go with this, I want movement to be a central part of, a, uh, of, 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 a, of an interpretive framework, right? That, so I mean, there's literal movement, and then what, is it, what does it mean to think about movement as sort of being a, a kind of hermeneutic, um, a part of a larger framework um, that helps us to think about different categories that can inform a more open-ended theology? Because I know growing up in Pentecostalism, the idea of an open-ended theology was to admit unfaithfulness. And so this, so I think this other point, and then I, uh, then I'll go finally to Roberts, is a kind of unfaithfulness, a kind of, uh, I mean, a kind of her, uh, a being heretical uh, in a sense. And so I think what also is at stake for me is sort of the claim that in this kind of open-ended uh, theology, it actually enables us to be as faithful as we can, given the ongoing an unfolding revelation of God. So as you can see, movement, even the way I'm talking about the ongoing and unfolding revelation of God, movement is just not what is literally being done, say bodies or creation of the world, uh, but, but actually it is, it, it is an epistemology. It is a way of thinking about ultimately the, sh the shape and character, the form, before we get to the content, just the form of, of Christian theology as such and, and why that matters to, you know, to continued faithfulness. Um, and then finally, yeah, the story of Babel, um, I want to cont continue thinking about this. Um, I do know this much that, and this is Willie Jennings, his amazing, we were talking about commentary acts, so this is, these are not my words, these are, are, are Jennings' words. Um, uh, if you haven't read Willie Jennings' uh, commentary on acts, please do so. It is one of, it is one of the most beautifully written and uh, substantively uh, uh, written uh, commentary on acts, but for Willings, uh, Jennings, and I tend to agree with him here, that um, one way of thinking about, and the reason why we do need to think about the story of Babel to all that I'm saying right now, is because in many ways Jennings sees Pentecost as a kind of counterpoint in some ways uh, to the story of Babel um, in the sense that um, uh, 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 in the story of, uh, of Babel, you have in some ways a kind of uh, 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 part of the narrative, maybe I should say, because I'm not a biblical scholar, so I want to be careful here <laughs> that I'm not uh, interpreting this, this, this uh, story in a way that might not be in keeping. Um, but in the ways that at least I have heard it, um, that in some ways part of what creates sort of these different languages and, and, and whatnot um, is this desire to transcend uh, the source of let's make a, a something up to the heavens, right, to become God. There's this desire to transcend or triumph, right, to sort of master. The problem is about the issue of mastery, right? How do we master, uh, um, in some ways, the heavens, so to speak? We want to build something up to the heavens as a way to master 
you know, our world, what we're doing materially. And part of what I hear Jennings saying in the Acts commentary, it's not just at Pentecost, but it's also what happens in the early church after Pentecost, that this is a way of thinking against logics of ownership, of thinking against logics of mastery. Um, with, and, I mean, this goes back to the question of movement. It is trying to, and I'll talk about in this next lecture, it is trying to think against um, ideas of mastery as sort of the privileged way of under, or understanding uh, uh, who God is. So if we can get a very coherent account of God, right, and that is the account that we, we have, we can sort of own that model or master. There can be no internal contradictions. If there's an internal contradictions, we try to sort of excise that out, right, of the model that we are explicating, say, on the doctrine of God. Um, from a philosophical perspective. Um, and, and so what that sort of, you know, I think what Jennings is getting at, what I'm trying to get at, is to push against that kind of impulse for mastery uh, and so forth. And I think that that's in part what Jennings is trying to get at as well as Pentecost, being a response to the story of Babel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. We look forward to the second uh, lecture. Uh, let's let's break and let's return to like uh, five to eleven, uh, with half an hour or so for the for the break. And you're all invited back to the second lecture. I know some uh, students might have classes, then oh, yeah. other classes as well. Uh, thanks also for all the students that.